do you believe in life after death? That once we leave this world behind, we continue on in another dimension or realm? I'm sure we've all heard stories or maybe even experienced things for ourselves that give us clues as to what lies beyond this physical world. But what if there was a way to prove once and for all, with scientific study, that there is indeed life after death? Well, that's exactly what the Skoll Experimental Group set out to do. And they didn't want to provide just one or two pieces of evidence. They wanted to produce enough evidence that scientists and skeptics from all walks of life would take notice. We wanted to provide physical evidence for other people to witness that would provide, in a scientific way, actual proof of life after death. In 1993, the Skoll Experimental Group started a five-year experiment to produce tangible, physical evidence from the spirit world. Evidence that could be studied, tested, and measured. The experiment concluded in 1998 with interesting results to say the least, including audio, video, and photographic evidence. I'm Brooke. Thanks for tuning in to Armchair Investigator. In today's episode, we'll be diving into the Skoll Experiment to find out if life after death truly exists. Widely regarded as the most important scientific investigation of evidence for life after death in history, the Skoll experiments began in early 1993 in the small village of Skoll in Norfolk. The Skoll Experimental Group was formed, consisting of seven people, Robin and Sandra Foy, Diana and Alan Bennett, a French woman named Mimi, a man named Ken, and his friend Burnett. The Foys, who had long been involved in paranormal research, were looking for the right mix of energies to help them further their work into physical, or tangible, paranormal phenomena. Things that everyone could experience, like light, sounds, touches, taste, and smell, versus one person receiving a message and relaying it to others. The group operated independently, were non-religious, and non-political. Their work was intended to be universal and embraced by people from all walks of life, no matter their beliefs. The group met weekly to conduct scientific research into the paranormal, with much of their work taking place in the cellar of Robin and Sandra Foy's home in Skoll. And while there, they believed they made contact with spirits. The entities they communicated with would come to be known as a spirit team, a unit consisting of thousands of minds all working together to help produce tangible proof of the existence of other dimensions. The spirit team reportedly even consisted of former scientists and researchers. The group of seven met in January of 1993, and the experiment was slow to start. At first, not much happened. Some knocks on the wall and faint whistles. But the group persisted. Then in April, three months after starting, the group received its first tangible sign when an item on the table was suddenly knocked on the floor. The following week, the same thing happened. When they played back the audio recording of the session, the group noticed that there was constant static on the tape up until the object moved. From that point, the static ceased and the rest of the audio was clear, leading the group to believe that some sort of energy had been built up by the spirit side in order to move the object. Throughout the summer of 1993, contact with the other side continued to develop. The group saw faint lights, witnessed patches of mist appear out of nowhere, and often felt something tugging on their clothes. Up until this point, Sandra and Robin Foy were used for trance communication, meaning they allowed spirits to communicate through them. But the Foy's weren't exactly thrilled about this. They felt it put them under psychological pressure to perform, so to speak, and didn't want to compromise the sessions. That's when the group handed the reins over to the spirit team to let them decide the best way forward. First, the spirit team took Alan into trance to speak through him. Then they started using his wife, Diana. And that's when things really began to take off. The sessions in the cellar were described as stepping into another world, a world where different rules apply. Very nice, nice of you to have us here. During many of the sessions at school, both Alan and Diana were in a trance, allowing their bodies to be used by members of the spirit team for verbal communication so that the whole team could talk to the group. And if a scientist on the spirit side needed to give instructions, it still allowed for uninterrupted, continued communication. 
In October of 1993, the group received its first tangible item, a teleported coin. And not just any coin. It was a mint condition Churchill Crown coin, a coin that hadn't been produced since 1966. Soon, they were seeing bright lights, and objects in the room started levitating. While contact with other dimensions had been slow to start, the speed of which there was regular communication had ramped up. By mid-1994, the spirit team was writing on paper with a pencil that was instructed to be left on the floor. And the school group witness projected images of spirits in the cellar that would eventually progress into solid manifestations later on down the road. The school group claimed that the spirits were actually transporting themselves from their dimensions into ours. But who was the spirit team? While there were reportedly thousands of minds in the spirit team, there were only a small number of individuals who were able to communicate. Throughout the five years and 500 sessions, the group was introduced to a number of members on the spirit team. Four of the main spirit scientists who came through were introduced as William, Albert, Joseph, and Edwin. The spirit team also consisted of beings from all walks of life. Some of the regular communicators were a woman named Mrs. Bradshaw, who often relayed messages. Emily, when did you live on the Earth? Oh, a long time ago now. 19th century? Yes. And Mrs. Bradshaw, who was a very commanding figure, um, a lady of um, you know, the upper-class Victorian or Edwardian lady, or well, she sounded like that. We continue from our side of life to influence people still in the body. She would tell us what was going to happen. She would comment on what we were doing and sometimes what we were thinking. A former priest named Patrick McKenna. We had Patrick... Uh, the defrocked Irish priest that came through. He seemed to come through when we need lifting up a little bit, you know. Good evening to you. Hello, God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. I never heard such a commotion. <laughs> <laughs> such a carrying on. <laughs> no, it's all right. I'm only joking. <laughs> and an Indian guide named Raji, who discussed many of the upcoming experiments with the group. Really contributed to the joyousness of the affair, because it was quite a jolly affair. Hello, uh, Raji. Good evening. Good afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> Talk free. And this will help enormously. As Mr. Robin was saying, you must... You must... Uh, you must... What was he saying? <laughs> 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 I've forgotten already, right? <laughs> yes. well, whatever it was he was saying, you must do it. <laughs> After the first apport, remember the Churchill Crown, events at school continued to develop rapidly. During their session on November 1st, 1993, the group heard a series of thuds throughout the evening. At the end of the session, when the lights were turned on, there were objects lying on the table for each member of the group. A silver thimble, two small silver lockets, a silver chain bracelet, a St. Christopher medallion, an ornate miniature spoon and bowl, and a tiny gold medallion with hieroglyphics on it. The group would go on to receive more than 70 physical apport items over their five-year experiment. According to the spirit team, the reason that they were able to communicate so intensely with the school group boiled down to what they referred to as creative energy. A mixture of spiritual energy from the spirit team's world, human energy taken from the seven members during the experiments, and earth energy, a natural energy that exists here in our world. The spirit team also created a spiritual doorway around the session table in which spirits could pass through something that became another turning point in the experiment. From there, the group said their weekly sessions became more and more spectacular. They were various shapes, generally like a pea-sized light, and it had substance. They would come and sit on your hand, and you could feel them. There was constant knocking on the walls, chairs, and table and orbs of light seemed to methodically move about the room. All seven members were asked to meditate for a short time each day to prepare them for sessions and raise their vibrational energy. 
The spirit side explained that the meditation, harmony, and love present during the sessions would help generate healing energy within the group and take things to a new energy level. This was tested during their January 3rd, 1994 session, one that was full of activity. The light bulbs pinged, bells rattled, and orbs danced on the table. We're never sure exactly what the lights were, except, because obviously we asked questions about it, except that they were animated spirits, but they weren't, as it were, fully formed. They weren't um, discarnate entities as we understand them. Uh, they were somewhere in between. Then, to everyone's amazement, the table levitated about a foot off the ground. At the end of the session, once the lights were turned on, seven objects were waiting on the table. An ancient whalebone spoon, a mother-of-pearl necklace, a carved ivory cocktail stick, a pearl and leaf brooch, a marcasite necklace, a silver anchor cross and heart charm, and a silver St. Bernadette medallion inscribed with the name Kara on it. Critics of the apported objects argue that there could have been one or more members of the group who were tricking the others. While some point out that this would have been an elaborate and expensive trick, given the sheer number of objects, their origin, rarity, and value. The group also went to great lengths to ensure the integrity of their sessions. They wore Velcro LED glow bracelets on their wrists so that their movements could be monitored at all times and not easily removed without making noise. They wore luminous tabs on their knees and placed tabs on objects in the room. And there was only one door to exit and enter the cellar. A tape recorder was placed on the table and microphones were used on the walls and floors to capture sound. Thermometers were placed at ground and ceiling levels in the cellar and on the porch outside for comparison. The temperature was recorded at the start and end of each session. It was explained to the group that they were the first people to be successfully used by the spirit world to pioneer this new form of energy work. The spirit team asked the group to keep their findings under wraps until their work was more advanced. It was said that the spirit team really wanted to focus on producing physical, paranormal phenomena that would be suitable for public demonstration to audiences around the world in order to prove the reality of life after death. They wanted to move away from traditional methods since they hadn't worked in convincing most people of the reality of life after death. Some of the events that occurred at school had important scientific implications and an experimental basis, allowing them to be checked, tested, and verified. While other events seemed more personal in nature and were harder to fact check. Either way, the group felt that it was all valuable information, as it was evidence showing that we indeed survive after death. And a great deal of the evidence was coming from outside the two mediums, Diana and Alan. By January of 1994, the group was experiencing things like physical contact, water on their skin, light orbs touching them, and spoken words seemingly coming out of thin air. We do not speak. We think in a language we are familiar with. Yeah. In this case, it is our language that we knew when we lived upon the earth. Yeah. And by some miracle, I have to say, <laughs> these energies are transported into your room, yeah. not by me, but by those whose job it is to do that. On February 28, 1994, at the request of the spirit team, the photography experiments began. The school group brought a 35mm camera without flash and loaded it with conventional 24-frame 35mm color film. During the session, the camera was placed on a wooden chair beside Sandra Foy, who had been briefed by the spirit team to take photographs in total darkness, but only when she was specifically asked to do so. And here's the thing. Because the sessions were done in total darkness, technically, nothing should show up on the film. The spirit team explained that they would try to communicate messages by projecting images into the camera and onto the film. Sandra was instructed to pick up the camera and wait for the team to give the word before taking a picture. The group said that an orb of light hovered in front of the camera and Sandra was instructed to take a photo. A short while later, she was told that she could take pictures as she wished. After taking a few snaps, she put the camera down on the wooden chair next to her, where, to everyone's amazement, 
the camera continued taking pictures and without anybody pressing the button, it even wound itself up after each click. We heard the camera moving round over our heads, and clicking and being wound on by spirit. When the film was developed, the team wasn't expecting much. After all, the pictures were taken in the dark cellar with no flash. When the team reviewed the pictures, they were certain they were given the wrong film by mistake. That is until they came across a picture of the street taken just outside the Foy's home. It was definitely their film. And the rest of the photos were nothing short of incredible. There were a variety of images in the photographs and they seemed random. The first photograph was what appeared to be an image of St. Paul's Cathedral during the 1940s Blitz attack against the UK. There was a second photo of the same image, but it was sideways. The third photo appeared to show a wrecked bus after a night of wartime bombing. Like with the first photo, this one too had an additional sideways shot. The fifth photo showed the front page of the Daily Mirror, dated December 16, 1936. The sixth image showed a group of soldiers from the First World War. And the seventh showed a bright light. The group figured it was the one that had posed for the camera in the cellar. Pictures 8, 9, 10, and 11 showed various groups of people. One appeared to be a wedding photograph with the bride holding a bouquet. What did all these pictures mean? The group started investigating the origins of the photos, but they couldn't find much. They contacted the Daily Mirror, requesting a copy of the newspaper dated December 16, 1936. And when it arrived, the front page was nearly identical to the one in the photograph, but with a few differences, indicating it might have been from another edition printed on the same day. A few members of the Spirit team indicated that they had taken some of the photos while they were still alive, like the picture of the group of soldiers. The school group felt the implications of the photographic phenomenon was a cornerstone of their research. In their eyes, it represented tangible means of communication between dimensions, communication that lasted beyond their sessions. The following week, the 35mm camera was again placed in the cellar. The group also put out pencil and paper in case the spirit team wanted to write a message. But the spirit team had something else in mind for this session. They wanted the group to join in on an experiment to see if they could jointly control light orbs together using their thoughts alone. These spirit lights had now become the size of small saucers, and that evening the group had fun trying to direct their movement around the room. But midway through the session, Raji let the group know that they were building up to something special. And in order to achieve it, there would be a significant drop in the temperature. Suddenly, a deep voice was heard. It introduced itself as Paxton and explained to the group that it wasn't normally possible for him to communicate directly with those on Earth, but there had been an important decision made by the Council of Communion and that the work they were doing would be important in the future. That was the first time the group had heard of the Council of Communion, which apparently consisted of 13 evolved souls. The group would later learn that there were many councils, and their role was to oversee the experimental communication between the spirit world and the groups on Earth. Over the next few sessions in March, the group brought two 35mm SLR cameras into the cellar with them. Both cameras had brand new film in them when they started, and neither was equipped with a flash. At the end of the session, each of the two films contained 11 images, making a total of 22 photographs. This time, every image was different. They included people, places, objects, and statues from all over the world. But how was this happening? The spirit team explained that the images were actually thought patterns and energy form, and that in these early experiments, many of the images they received were actually copies of photographs that already existed somewhere in the world. However, later pictures wouldn't be like that at all. Now that the spirit team and skull group had worked together to build a solid foundation of trust, opened multiple lines of communication, and had sustained a reservoir of energy, the next phase of the experiment was about to begin. From April of 1994 to September of 1995, the work of the spirit team heavily focused on providing indisputable evidence of life after death. This stage of the experiment would consist of four main objectives in order to give their work more credibility to invite outside visitors to witness their sessions, 
to eventually take their sessions out of the cellar so that others could observe what they were doing, to publish what they've learned to the world, and to invite men and women of science to investigate the phenomenon and report on their experiences. Sessions were now extended to an average of two and a half hours, and the spirit team asked the group to remove all objects from the room, including cameras, bells, and pencils and paper. Only the table remained. They also asked that only one recording machine be used during the sessions. Their last request was for a glass dome with a wooden base. This would help store energy for more complicated experiments. On Friday, September 23, 1994, in preparation for the first public demonstration, the group held a session at the local library in Skoll. The group wasn't sure what to expect, and they were worried that the phenomenon couldn't be created outside of the cellar. But their fears soon disappeared, as members of the spirit team came through to communicate. Spirit lights began to manifest themselves, and members of the group felt invisible hands touching their shoulders. And Ken, a member of the school group, was nearly pushed out of his chair. As far as they were concerned, the dry run at the library had proven successful. In October, the team returned to their experiments with spirit photography. Except this time, a camera wouldn't be required. The spirit team would be attempting to impress images onto film left on the table, and the group would be receiving original images, some from the spirit dimension. We were asked by the spirit team to put a totally unopened Polaroid 35mm film just in its plastic container on the table during our sessions. At the end of the, the session, if the spirit team felt that they'd achieved a result, we were asked to develop it. The school group stretched a 35mm roll of film out and placed a pack of Polaroid Instant Film on the table. But with no way to release the chemicals in the Polaroid Instant Film, they weren't able to develop any images. And the stretched roll of film didn't work out either. But the group wasn't giving up. During another session, they tried something different. This time, they put out a 35mm roll of film still in its factory sealed tub. They also placed two Instant Polaroid Films face down on the table. After the session, they attempted to develop them by placing the films back in their cassette and running them through the rollers of a Polaroid camera with the lens blacked out. Though no clear images were produced, there were shapes that appeared on them. When the group learned that Polaroid made 35mm film rolls that could be developed at home using a special machine, they got one right away. This meant that their film could be developed immediately, rather than taken to a store where they would have to wait. Again, because the sessions were done in a nearly pitch-black environment, technically no images should be produced on the film. And yet the group was seeing a variety of images being developed. A portrait of Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, the title page from a piece of sheet music, and even images of what they felt were underwater seascapes. The team also began receiving even more bizarre images. The spirit team said that they depicted areas of existence, and within these images were distinguishable faces. On October 4th, 1994, the group invited their first visitor. Then they began inviting two at a time, and then six. Each of the visitor sessions were successful, and this gave them confidence for a public debut. By the early summer of 1995, the group was becoming aware of solid spirit beings walking and shuffling around the room during sessions. These visitors found spare chairs in the cellar and could be heard dragging them across the floor in order to sit with the group at the table. They could even feel the fabric of their clothing as they passed by. One of the most striking features of the school experiment was the group's willingness to welcome outside investigation. On October 2, 1995, the first experimental session to be conducted under scientific scrutiny was held. Three members of the Society for Psychical Research, or SPR, sat in on a session. Montague Keen, Professor Arthur Ellison, and Professor David Fontana. The Society for Psychical Research has an extraordinarily um, notorious reputation for being scientifically rigorous, and many people consider that it goes overboard in its skepticism. Montague said, At the first meeting, I was shown many of the fascinating photographs. My interest here was that, if genuine, they were solid physical objects with which to experiment. 
This would enhance the possibility of checking the circumstances in which the phenomena were produced. As an investigator, I have a duty to observe objectively and take all precautions that other researchers would expect me to take, even though I might think them unnecessary. I felt these people were genuine, and they certainly didn't have the characters of con artists. It is, of course, always advisable to be cautious no matter how much you trust or believe in people. I made a detailed initial report for those of my colleagues who were also involved in this type of investigation. As a result, we arranged for a series of six meetings, which started in October 1995. The scientific investigators worked to ensure that protocols were observed and attempted to establish control over certain parameters of the experiments, especially in regards to the photographic films. This included bolting all doors themselves, searching the cellar and adjacent rooms, and checking for hidden entrances and equipment. Soon after, scientific investigators, electrical engineers, psychologists, mathematicians, and astrophysicists were being asked to witness and evaluate some of the photographic tests and experiments. The investigations involved individuals from NASA, the Institute of Noetic Sciences, and the Scientific and Medical Network. The work was conducted in a number of international locations, including Germany, Ireland, the Netherlands, Spain, Switzerland, and the United States. Nobody could find any evidence of fraud. And for some of these investigators, the things they witnessed proved the permanence of the soul and the survival of human consciousness. Here's what Dr. Hans Scher, who sat with the group on 13 occasions, including in his own home, had to say. I'm a down-to-earth person, a diehard realist and businessman with, due to my legal studies, a very critical and analytical mind. I am not psychic. All of my life it has been my intention to find out, if possible, whether there is life after physical death. My research has involved visiting the skull hole on various occasions, and I have participated in certain film and videotape experiments. I have personally conducted some experiments with which have taken place under test conditions. I have been witness to a number of highly interesting phenomena. I invited the school group to my old country house on the island of Ibiza. If they had ever faked anything within their own cellar, they had no chance whatsoever to do this in my home. Just before one experimental sitting, I came up with the idea of asking the spirit team if they could provide evidence by playing a musical instrument. The school group had neither the opportunity nor the time to prepare anything before the sitting began. The result of this request was fantastic. The trumpet, which I had placed on the table, started playing, even though the mouthpiece was removed. And later on, someone else started playing a drum solo on the wooden table, despite the fact that there were no drumsticks or other suitable objects available. At none of the sittings had the group the slightest opportunity to install any equipment of their own, which could have been used to generate fraudulent phenomena. I can therefore guarantee that the results of the school group are in every respect 100% genuine. When it came to the photography experiments, a four-step protocol was implemented so that the investigators could control the point at which the photographic images were produced and eliminate any possibility of physical intervention from the school group. First, it would be the investigators that would provide the film to be used. Second, they would ensure that the film was in a secure container, provided by them. Third, the investigators would have control of the container throughout the session. And finally, developing the film would also be under the control of the investigators. At the next meeting, on January 13, 1996, Professor Allison took a tub containing 35mm Polaroid film, which had been bought by Montague Keene, removed the chemical cassette, and placed the unopened tub containing the roll of Polaroid film in a security bag. Professor Ellison then sealed the unopened tub and took it downstairs for the experiment and placed it on the floor near his feet. After the session, the investigators opened the bag, removed the film tub, took the roll of film out, and put it through an electrical developer upstairs. Here's what they captured. At the fifth session, on February 17, 1996, most of the developed film was blank, but as the group continued looking through the film, they noticed that a few frames contained something. Three lowercase Greek letters set against a green background, almost as if it were illuminated. In English, these letters represent M, E, and N. 
Over additional sessions, more messages on film were developed, including this Latin mirror image message that translated to of reflection of light on the earth and the planets. I selected the film, checked the box, which was factory sealed, identifiable by the glue marks. This contained another sealed container and after checking the film I then resealed the plastic container with uh, an identifiable mark which was my signature. I'm a hundred percent certain that the film I selected was the same film that was returned to me at the end of the session. And this message that translates from chaos to the highest summit of mankind. One session produced a German poem and another session produced these aromatic symbols. They were able to achieve whole lengths of film, sometimes up to as much as four feet, with various words, symbols, messages, all sorts of different things on that film. You can imagine our surprise when we brought this film up, they'd never been opened, put it through the processor and viewed it, and there was images and faces and writing how do you explain it was there, you know? By August of 1996, the security bag was changed to a wooden box to improve security protocol. The box was designed in a way that it couldn't be opened without breaking the seals, meaning it was physically impossible for anyone in the group to tamper with the box. In early 1996, the audio experiments began. During a routine session on Valentine's Day, weird noises began coming from the tape player that the group used to play background music on. At first, they thought the tape player was about to jam, until a member of the spirit team told them that it was a new form of communication that they were experimenting with. Robin Foy was asked to turn down the volume in order to reduce the background music. But, oddly enough, the weird noises didn't decrease. It soon became evident that the noises the group was hearing were words, but they weren't easy to make out. A few months later, after switching to a battery-powered tape recorder with the microphone removed, the first audible word the group heard was a whispered, hello. The spirit team called this type of communication trans-dimensional communication, or TDC. Using this technique, the group was able to conduct conversations with beings and personalities in other dimensions that normally wouldn't be able to come through during a typical session. <laughs> Another set of experiments began towards the end of May 1997. This work was called Project Alice. The group began using video and mirrors to capture movement sent from the spirit world. You see, Back in 1994, when the photography experiments began, the group had initially asked if they could bring a video camera into the sessions. The spirit team said they weren't ready to do any specific work with video yet, and were worried about interference from the camera motor. The video camera idea was scrapped until 1997, when a new communicator came through and told the group that it was time to construct a double psychomantium in the cellar. The psychomantium would consist of two mirrors. One placed behind the video camera so that it could catch and reflect the light coming from the viewfinder back towards the other mirror, which would be situated in front of the camera. This setup would form a loop with the camera in the middle and create a doorway to and from other dimensions. The aim was to capture, on video, the spirit team members entering the cellar through this doorway. Initially, the camera was allowed to run for 45 minutes, the duration of a whole videotape. It was during these prep sessions that the group was able to record moving lights and visible objects that they believe came from another world. On June 5th, the video camera was set up and a brand new blank tape was inserted. Recording started before the room lights were turned off. After the session, the tape was played back, and they noticed something interesting on it. At the beginning of the film, before the lights were turned off, they saw the distinct face of a man smiling at them. Nobody knew who he was, and he certainly wasn't a member of the Skull Group. Everyone was thrilled to have caught something on camera. Moreover, 
This was pivotal for the group and their work because it had been recorded in the light. This meant that it was possible that future experiments could also be conducted in lighted conditions. On June 17th, the video camera ran for about 30 minutes. Then the spirit team told the group to stop recording. They were advised to carefully watch the video after the session was over. And, just like with their June 5th session, the activity occurred in lighted conditions at the start of the session. In the video, four members of the group were blocked out visually and audibly, while colored patterns and interference appeared on the film for a few moments, followed by images of what the group believed appeared to be a being from a far distant dimension. In early August of 1997, the spirit team asked the group to stop all visitor sessions for the foreseeable future, stating that whenever there were visitors present, the energy balance shifted, causing slowed progress. From August to December, the video results slowly amped up, and the group began to see colors, and then eventually, figures moving across the blue light. Eventually, they were seeing hands moving across the screen. On Monday, November 23, 1998, more than five years after the school experiment began, the group was told to shut down operations immediately after an unknown being began interfering with the interdimensional doorway the team had created. Whatever this being's motives were, the team wasn't sure they were good. The only sure way to prevent it from entering through the doorway was to stop the experiments altogether. The school group was devastated, saying, we knew the plan, we just hadn't anticipated that it would come about so dramatically. During the SCG's five-year experiment, their sessions included visual, oral, acoustic, and photographic tests. But the question remains, did they provide proof of survival beyond physical death? If the evidence is to be accepted, it means there is life after death. That we as humans do go on in conscious form. I know I've given you a lot to unpack today, but I cannot wait to hear from you. Do you believe in life after death? Let me know in the comments below. If you enjoyed today's video, give it a thumbs up. And hey, while you're at it, consider subscribing to the channel so you don't miss out on the next investigation.